episode 744 of Let the Be Talk is here on the Monday. What is it? April 8th. And uh, episode's a little late because I was fucking out late last night. I uh, went to go see Springsteen at the forum. And holy shit. I don't know how he does this. 74 years old. Played for three hours, 24 minutes. Because I came home last night and had to lay down for hours. <laughs> so fucking hats off to the Superman. Definitely one of those uh, rare, rare gems in rock and roll. I can't really think of anybody. I mean, you can you could say Jagger. But I, I don't, I put, I put Bruce above Jagger as far as a performer because Bruce is playing guitar, he's singing, he's playing a zillion songs, and, you know, he's not going off stage for a couple tunes while Keith Richards plays some, and he, he he's, he's fucking up there the whole time. Yeah. There we are. We're jumping into the episode right away. Which, by the way, thank you for joining me today. And uh, I appreciate every week. Solo episode is here. Tomorrow, I will be dropping the annual Watches and Wonders slash Basil World, which is no longer, but Watches and Wonders is here, with my man Bo Gorey and Kevin Christie. So that will be out tomorrow. So it's going to be like two episodes in two days. Sometimes I think about just doing five days a week, 15 minute episodes. See if that fucking stirs up your engine of ADD. Just an episode each day that's 15 minutes. I don't know. Got to try something, man. I'm on my 12th year and uh, you got to fucking mix it up. I don't know. Patreon.com slash Dean Del Rey for bonus episodes. Lots of them. I just put one up on Thursday. Make sure you subscribe. Let me just give a quick shout out and then I'll get back to the Springsteen uh, concert. Hold on. Let's go to the Patreon here, people. Uh, these people are gods to me. Sebastian Barantis joined up four days ago. Thank you. Kevin Molarelel. <laughs> Chris Doherty, Frank Ariola. I think I gave Frank a shout out last week, but all good. Anyway, uh, patreon.com got some bonus episodes. How many up there, man? I think it's over a hundred and fifty. It's 155 bonus episodes of Let There Be Talk. Is anybody listening? Is anybody listening to the podcast? Get out there. We want to bring on the people. Slipping into the Bruce Springsteen mode. What a what a performer. Did not like Bruce growing up. I grew up during the Born in the USA era. My mom loved him. Went and saw him. Uh, she did. Rest in peace, mom. Love you. Uh, she saw him on the Born in the USA tour 1984 when I was just peeking on, you know, screaming for vengeance. And uh, what else is out right around then? Just all of the great, great metal. Iron Maiden. All of that stuff. Saxon. Throw in a little bit of uh, Ozzy. Uh, you know, what? Diary of a Madman. Bark at the Moon. Blizzard of Oz. That kind of stuff. Born in the USA. I was like, I don't get it. Then later in life, it hit me like a fucking ton of lead, and I fell in love. And it all happened on the Ghost of, uh, Ghost of Tom Joad era. Saw that tour by accident at the Neil Young Bridge Benefit, and I've told the story before, but that has, uh, that has kick-started, that kick-started basically the uh, insane love of Bruce Springsteen. I've seen him many, many times, including a few years ago in New York City at one of the most incredible performances I've ever seen from a human, the Broadway show. 
I cried, I laughed, and uh, I, I, I thought about a lot of stuff in my own life. And uh, it's very rare we're at a concert and it mixes up so many emotions. So that being said, I went to the forum last night and I want to give a shout out to my man, Mike. I'm not going to say his last name so people don't try to Google him and go, hey, can you get me into uh, Bruce, man? I'm a big fan. But uh, my buddy, Mike, who is a, a huge supporter of my comedy, and my podcast and a great friend happened to work for Bruce and uh, hooked it up deluxe style, 100%. They had like a snake pit type of thing where th there was a general admission area where you could get in there and not be too crowded. One thing that did bo uh, bother old man Dean is it was nice and loose in there but there was some fucking jackasses who every five minutes, I, I really can't believe how much booze people need to drink at a Bruce Springsteen concert. I'm sitting there stone cold sober, getting so fucking high on raw emotions that's coming from Bruce. And I'm blown away. There's this four people in front of me, I moved around away from them and somehow they kept fucking finding me like a shit magnet. Somehow I, I, I'm made of metal and here comes the, the magnet of shit just sticks to me. I went solo so I could fucking ditch them. But the amount of booze that all these fucking people were drinking was insane. And I get it, the uh, the venue sells booze, but holy shit, they were the big fucking beers too. It was it looked like it was maybe two cans of beer in the big ass plastic cup, and these fucking people, man, they and, and they drinking the booze and then talking. Yeah, man, I'm fucking, you know, I'm waiting for the eclipse. Uh, yeah, fucking, you got a goddamn genius up there, one of the last to do it at the highest fucking level. And they're over there talking about the fucking eclipse. Get the fuck out of here. <laughs> Man, I was steaming. But I finally got away from them and uh, got myself a nice spot and took it in, man. And I was, you know, with Bruce. The, listen, I love Bruce. And I love the dead now, which I didn't like the dead when I was growing up two bands that were just too deep for heavy metal Dean. And then you find them later and you're like, thank God. Thank God. I have some, uh, you know, genius art to dig into, but, um, there's a lot of Bruce songs that I don't like. And there are so many that I love that you get a little bit, uh, you know, you're like, I only want this fucking era Bruce and I'm sure there's people out there that just want born to run there's people that just want the river he did that river tour there's people that just want darkness there's people that want the born in the USA but with me I I like a lot of newer Bruce stuff over the last 20 years stuff like the rising record and uh, some stuff on wrecking ball and all of ghost of Tom Joad all of it I fucking love. So I'm not like some guy that's like, I only like the first four records because uh, that is just not true. But when it comes to the set list, man, I get it. Bruce needs to, you know, get off on it himself. He's been playing that Born to Run, Darkness, River stuff most of his life. So uh, respect to him. And I got lucky. A lot of it was in the Dean Love Love, uh, love line. Let me see. let me look at the set real quick. Opened with uh, open all night, and uh, I didn't even that song. I was like, ah, oh, what is this? <laughs> but then he fucking kills it with lonesome day, which I love that song. Lonesome day, fucking great. Groove it all night. Two hearts. 
I like two hearts. Ghost, okay song. Letter to you, okay. Promise Land, unbelievable song. Death to my hometown, uh, you know, I could do without it. Uh, tougher than the rest, his wife came out. She was only on stage for two songs. She used to be in the band full time. I talked about it on a bonus episode a couple days ago. She does not really tour with Bruce anymore, and they haven't really uh, made a big deal or said anything about it. But she did tougher than the rest in fire. And then uh, it kind of kicks into uh, gear. Hungry Heart comes on, and I posted it on my Instagram. It was one of the most beautiful things I've ever seen in my life at a concert. I have never seen this. There were two old ladies. One looked really old. I would say maybe around 81, two, three, maybe 85. And there was another woman next to her. And I was thinking, well, that must be her daughter or a sister. And they had a sign that said, please play Hungry Heart. Bruce was fucking staring at him. He's singing. And I just, man, I, I started like tearing up. Because they turned the sign and said, this is our very first concert. And I thought to myself, this is incredible. You know, like I said on my Instagram, I started comedy at 44. People are like, you're too old. What are you doing? You know? And I just thought for a good 20 minutes, it took me out of the concert for a minute. I was going through the emotions and the what it would take for them to get to the show. Because to get to the forum is brutal. And you're at an age, let's say 81 years old, and maybe that's your daughter. I think it might have been the sister because she might have been like 70 five or something you can see the video in my instagram so i sat there and thought not only is this their first concert but they don't need to ever see an, a one again because it'll be all downhill from there on for them <laughs> i mean they are seeing the fucking best and i thought look at them man out there living a life wherever they live i could just imagine the scenario you know the the mom to the daughter or the the sister to the younger sister. You know, I've never seen Bruce. I haven't either. You know, we should go. Yeah, we should go. I don't know where they live. I don't know how they got there. But the first thing you got to do is have enough money at that age, which a lot of people don't. Old people are living on a fixed income and it's brutal out there, especially if they live in California. Unbelievable. You got to have enough money to get a ticket. Then you got to... Get on the internet. So maybe they got some kids that got them, whatever. Then you got to get to the concert. But before you go to the concert, you stop at fucking, I don't know, Kinko's and you get a giant piece of pink fucking paper and you make this two-sided sign. Please play Hungry Heart and turn it over. This is our very first concert ever. Now you got to make a sign. You get back in the car, or maybe you Ubered there, whichever, still fucking brutal. Then you get to the venue. You got to walk pretty far into the forum. You got your fucking sign. You're ready to go. Meanwhile, there's people in your community, wherever you live, they're going, what are you doing, Mildred? You're too old to go to a concert. You're not a child. Quit trying to fucking relive old days. It's dangerous out there. People your age don't go to concerts. Mildred and Gertrude, what are you doing, Gertrude? Bring in your sister to that concert. Just fucking negative chatter. Like when I start in comedy, you're too old. What are you doing? Then they get into the venue. They have primo seats behind Max Weinberg. And now they got to hope Bruce sees him couple of uh, beautiful old women back there just holding the sign. Yay! Also, they got to stand up for three hours, 24 minutes, which I'm fucking having a hard time doing. Bruce is rocking it at 74. I'm standing there in my fucking boots going, I should have worn my New Balance. What am I, dumb? 
but I wanted to look cool, man. I want to look cool at the concert. <laughs> and then Bruce, there he is. He turns, he sees him. They break into Hungry Heart. And my fucking, my heart just, right now I'm thinking about my mom. Oh, my mom just rocking out at the Born in the USA concert. And I'm just, I'm just fucking, you know, I'm just overwhelmed with emotions. And then I'm thinking about my fucking first time seeing Bruce and, and just everything going through me. And there I am just deep into emotions and loving every minute of it in between these beer drinking, fucking equips, talking piece of shits. <laughs> It was, my, it was definitely the most beautiful thing I've ever seen in my 2,000, 3,000 concerts I've been to. It was unreal. And Bruce just giving it all to him, just everybody got a hungry heart. Unbelievable. Anyway, great set list. Uh, Sherry Darling, somebody threw a sign up. He played that, you know, the E Street Band. Holy shit, man. Let me give the proper glory for the E Street Band because I want to tell you something that uh, really blows my mind, okay? All right, of course, we know we got Nils there, and he's fantastic. And then Jake Clemens has taken over on the sax for his uncle who passed away. Then you got the Steve Van Zant who's been the band leader since fucking, you know, the 70s. Uh, Max Weinberg, absolutely killer. And uh, and then rest in peace, Danny, who played the B3. Roy Bitten, I'm going to get into this. Gary Talent, Roy Bitten, and Max Weinberg absolutely fucking blew my mind last night. I was focusing on them. Because I was thinking about, wait a minute. First of all, Bruce, yeah, he's in shape. And he's playing for three hours, 24 minutes. But you're in the E Street Band. You've been in the E Street Band for 40 years. And if you want to stay in the E Street Band, you have to stay in shape like Bruce. You have to, you know, not have arthritis. You got to be uh, wanting to tour and stand up there for three hours, 24 minutes, giving it your all. And at that moment, I was like, oh, I, I would want to be the keyboard player in this band so I could sit down for the three hours, 24 minutes. But the insanity of how good Roy Bitten is on the piano, if you go and listen to the live records, um, the 75 Hammersmith, which is the Born to Run tour, and then the 78 uh, Darkness, I believe it is, tour. There's, those are both on streaming platforms. And really concentrate on what that fucking guy is playing on piano. And then you get into the bass of Gary. It is unreal the nuances and the subtleties and how fucking much this is part of the sound of Bruce. Look, Bruce, I've seen him many times acoustic and just kill it. Bruce is fucking a freak of nature. But to, you know, have these guys that lived around your area, the, the fluke of that, like this guy and that guy and this guy. This will be the E Street Band. And then they're still alive, most of them. It is unreal. And the bass is just fucking cool. I was like watching them just... He's just fucking killing it. Beautiful. Beautiful, man. Um... The highlight of the night for me, and mostly because it's always my highlight on Bruce bootlegs from the 70s, is Spirit in the Night. And it is such an incredible song. I don't know how he wrote that. I wrote a, long, a lot of songs in my life. No way 
could I ever get to the level of like spirit in the night? It is unreal. And that's about mid show. It was song 13. We were only about an hour and a half in and Mike came up to me and goes, we're only halfway there. I know how long he plays and it does not feel long. It's like when I saw Rollins do spoken word, you're so engaged in it. Unless you're those beer drinking buffoons. You're so into it that you're like, holy shit, we've been in here three hours, 24 minutes. Spirit of the Night into one of the greatest newer songs, My City of Ruin. And I remember when I was touring with the Wallflowers, at the end of the night, we did an encore. And, uh, you know, I would sing a chorus out of, uh, a chorus and a verse out of My City of Ruins. In the middle of, I believe we were doing the band, The Weight. I can't remember which one, but I would bust that out in the middle. My City of Ruin, it, it is so great, man. Then Night Shift, which is unbelievable. Bruce has a giant band on this tour. He's got like six background singers and six horns. And these background singers came out and they did Night Shift by the Commodores, and it crushed. Oh, my God. And Last Man Standing was a tribute to his first band, Bruce being the Last Man Standing. It's on a, uh, uh, a recent record. Wrecking Ball, off of Wrecking Ball. Then the great Tom Morello comes out. And it's funny because I did not notice the entire show that this Marshall half stack was up there and it's the same rig that Tom's played since day one of uh rage against the machine that chewed up fucking Marshall head. And he came out with that, that badass, uh, I think it's a Kramer, uh, with the fucking hockey puck, hockey stick headstock. And he just slid out, did the solo for 41 shots, which is a beautiful fucking dark tune. Then he stayed up there and he did the ghost of Tom Joad. Cause you know, uh, he did a tour with Bruce, which is fucking wild. And he even sang a verse of ghost of Tom Joad. And he absolutely just smoked it. And Bruce was giving him, uh, they were going solo to solo to solo. And Bruce was fucking 74. Just fucking. I'll post it on my Instagram tomorrow. He was killing he was killing. You know, I looked at Bruce for a good three hours. I was looking at him. I was like, holy shit, man. You know, this guy looks better than anybody in the biz. And I really stared at him for a, wh a while. And I thought, you know, if Bruce was a crushing actor, which he was on uh, Curb last uh, Sunday, the, uh, the final Curb, but if Bruce was a true fucking actor, and I've said this about Sean Penn, Bruce could play Sonny Barger uh, towards the end of his life, Sonny. That era of Sonny, 60 to 70, uh, 75. Because Bruce looks like fucking Sonny Barger hair meets if Joe Strummer was still alive. That's, you know, that's what Bruce... Reminds me of it. like just a, a Joe Strummer meets Sonny Barger, just American up there, but not in the cheesy way of like American man, I'm American, just authentic. Even though Bruce has said over the years that he has felt like a phony singing about working on cars and racing, and he didn't really do any of that. You know, Peter Benchley didn't fucking get in the cage with Jaws. And, uh, you know, good writers can conjure up incredible visions for you to dive into. You know, there's people that are writing autobiographies and there's people that are writing, you know, full fiction. They're both great if they're done well. But Bruce, man, goddamn, he looks fucking great. Skin is smooth. He's, he's got perfect fucking hair. He wasn't even sweating, really. I'd love to know his workout regimen, what he eats, if he's on a little bit of roids or whatever. Um, 
I, you know, fuck man, this guy is, he's inspiring, man. Not just his music and his art, but his, his health. That should be the thing that inspires most of those fucking 29 beer drinking fools in there. You know, like he's going to be alive longer than you fucking 41 beers. <laughs> Gus to Tom Jode. Shout out Tom Morello killing it. Then they go into the rising, which I like. I saw the rising tour a few times. He played the entire rising record. Uh, I should have only seen it once because it's beautiful. You see it a couple times. You're like, oh, shit, all of the rising again. But the rising's a great, great record. And so is uh, the ghost of Tom Jode as far as the records from the last 20 years or so. Then hits with Badlands, Unbelievable, Thunder Road. He doesn't even leave the stage for an encore. They all stand up front. They give a fucking thank you, Los Angeles. Then they put their instruments back on. The house lights come on, and it's like full festive party for the next 40 minutes. Born to Run, Rosalita, Glory Days, Dancing in the Dark, 10th Avenue Freeze Out, Detroit Medley. And then uh, I'll see you in my dream solo acoustic. Beautiful. Beautiful. I've said it over and over. I got about four more concerts in me. And uh, I'm glad that was one of them. And if Bruce uh, decides to do that Broadway uh, concert play, one man show in LA, I'll see that again. Thank you, Bruce Springsteen, for the years of unbelievable, unbelievable music. And uh, man, just inspiring for me to constantly try to do something good, which uh, is really fucking hard in the world of art. You, you, you got to fucking have this barometer. It's like, oh man, do they want shit, pussy, fart jokes? Or do they like fucking, you know, smart jokes? I'm not the smartest dude by far. Got a lot of street smarts. I've been around the world multiple times. I love good art. So I'm always trying to get there. But it is a balance. You know, even with Bruce. He's got Hungry Heart. But then he's got Adam Reza Kane. So I get it, man. I get it. Uh, I wish they played Adam Reza Kane. I wish they played Point Blank. Uh, I wish they played Youngstown, which is a fucking head spinner tune. There's a lot of tunes I wish he played, but it's all good, man. I got it on uh, my streaming platforms, which, by the way, I just saw this uh, Instagram uh, post about the streaming farms that are robbing newer bands of royalties because record companies have hired these streaming farms in like China and stuff where they just have like 5,000 phones on like sticks and somebody goes around and just constantly or AI does it and just picks such and such song to where it just keeps getting streamed. And then they get, um, you know, they, they get royalties and they get in the top 10 and people are like, this is fucking bullshit. And I'm like, this is old. The, the fucking business has always been rigged, my friends. It's always been fixed. A lot of people don't even remember 20 years ago. SoundScan came out where when you bought a CD at a, at a record store, the guy would go and it would scan as a sale. And then late night, one fucking Tower Records employee would get some bump money from uh, somebody at Warner Brothers in a bag, and he's in the back. Bidip, 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 bidip. Old school. And then before that, a little thing called payola that you've seen a million documentaries on, where the record companies go down to the fucking radio stations and go, play Van Halen 1, here's 5,000 bucks. And uh, a sack of cocaine. Play it until you fucking die. So it's always been rigged. And I say it over and over on the podcast. It's the people that 
make the artist the winner. Of course, you got the scammers. There's always going to be that. But there's the other thing, the power of the people. If they go, I like this, and they tell a friend, I like this, and they tell a friend, I like this, and they buy a ticket to see you live. They join your Patreon, or they, whatever it is, they go to a, a, a screening of whatever you got out, a film, or, or they go to an art gallery and they see your paintings. It's the power of the people will always beat the fucking stream farms. So, you know, that's why I'm always saying, please leave a review on iTunes. And, uh, you know, after a while, you run out of a gas of, like, asking you guys. I'm fucking happy that you're even listening to it, the podcast, you know? And that's just the fucking truth. But I do throw that out once in a while. And of course, I know it sounds like a goddamn broken record, but this stupid shit here where you got to get into the algorithms and you got to, you know, I had a meeting yesterday with someone. They go, you got to do this with your YouTube and then you got to fake and make it this thumbnail and then you got to do this and then you got to post it right at 11. And if you don't, you're going to, it's just like, and I'm not complaining. I've been doing comedy now for uh, 14 and a half years, and I love every second of it. And there's been some huge ups and some huge fucking downs, which, by the way, Comedy Store turned 52 yesterday, and uh, I saw something that was interesting on there. They had a they had a 52 anniversary yesterday, and I read the post by the comedy store. I'm not quite sure who writes the post there. Sometimes they switch. I don't know if it's uh, Peter Shore. I don't know if it's the Instagram people or I don't know who it is, but I was reading this and it said uh, 52 years ago today, we opened the original doors to the first time. We had no idea the adventure. We were starting when the first comedian grabbed the microphone. Over the years, there has been endless joy Laughter, heartache, surprise, frustration, luck, hope, and love. When I read that, if somebody asked me about my, my time at the comedy store in the last 14 years to right now today, I would go, over the years, there's been endless joy, laughter, heartache, surprise, frustration, luck, hope, and love. And there is no bigger truth in a sentence than that for me at the comedy store. It's, uh, it's been a place that's been fantastic to me. It's been a place that's been frustrating. It's been a place of great friends and family. It's been a place of uh, joy, tears. I've lost some friends there. And... Uh, I've said it many times, if the comedy store was not in Los Angeles, I don't think I would live here, you know? I, I, I bust my ass to be part of that. And, uh, you know, I'm constantly the squeaky wheel that gets the, uh, the oil once in a while. So happy 52 anniversary. Fuck, man, you're almost the same age as me. And uh, the history of that place is absolutely fantastic and historic. It has to be a historic landmark soon because there's no place more insane than that place of uh, what it's created and the talent that's been in there. Unreal. I was, tell I was talking to uh, uh, Ann Wilson uh, they her camp reached out to me to do some comedy with Hart last week. I couldn't do it because I was uh, on the road, but maybe something coming up. Who knows? And that was that would be a band I would go out and open for because, I mean, Hart is just it is inc that band's incredible to me, and it would be wild, just you know, a couple shows here or there or whatever. But. Uh, uh, she was talking about how she hung out at the comedy store in the uh, 80s with Sam Kinison. And I think she said Eddie Murphy. 
So the amount of fucking people that have been in that place, not just the comedians, but all kinds of other people in the world that have drawn in there. It's fucking wild. Max Weinberg was at the store a couple nights ago from uh, the E Street Band. So very cool. 52 years, and um, I have enjoyed my time there and looking forward to many other years, hopefully. You just never know. There's no guarantee that you're going to go on there unless you're a big fucking star. You're a big star, man. You're going on every fucking night at any club in town because they need you. And uh, so it's a constant... Um, but I just want to get big enough to where I could work there five nights a week. That's all. That's all I want to do. And then go on the road at the end of the year, record a special or whatever you do, you know, tour bus, but work at the store every night at the highest level. That to me is doing art. You know, it's uh, more than any club I've ever done my whole life changed the day i walked on that patio uh december 6 2009 and uh i'll never forget it thank you comedy store uh speaking of opening for bands my good friend marcus king who i did two months with uh what was that like almost two years ago now or what was that a year and a half i i don't know fucking time just goes by it's a blur it is a goddamn blur, man, the time. Marcus King, I have been promoting on this podcast for years and years. And he has been, you know, one of my favorites in the last 20 years, hands down. Marcus King, Rival Sons, um, you know, Neil Francis, these bands that hit me and I'm just, I just fall in love with them. So Marcus King, when we were on tour, revealed to me that he was uh, on the download working on a record with Rick Rubin. And I was so excited because you guys know how much I love Rick Rubin and you know how much I love Marcus King. And so he had played me some of it and I was like, wow, this is way different. And I've said it over the last year or so that uh, I was fired up that he was taking a giant leap away from his kind of core crowd. Let's see who takes the ride with Marcus. You know, early on, he's, he's kind of blues Rocky and he's out in that blues scene. And then he kind of steps up into the kind of, ZZ Top Black Crows kind of sound without the Marcus King band. And now he has stepped into a total fucking change. And the balls to do that, the balls to do it, a completely different sound. It sounds like Marcus, his voice is there, but it's not burning guitar. It's what I love the most about music, and I've talked to Marcus about it many times, it's soul rock to the highest level. And for Rick and him, Marcus, to put this together, it's just unbelievable out there at Shangri-La. And I've said it before, it's kind of a Maxwell, D'Angelo, Adele, uh, Aretha Franklin, it's it's got that heavy vibe with some cool subtle drum loops and real sparse arrangements lots of uh you know Wurlitzer and b3 keys piano in there just unreal mood swings came out on friday and i'm gonna tell you dig into this record and uh enjoy it and 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 take the fucking ride, man. I'm going to uh, give a couple shout outs to some tunes that I really love on this record. This is how I know he he's not really worried about, you know, anybody that plays music or comedy, they want to be successful, mostly so they can keep doing this uh, for the rest of their lives. 
but he's got a song on there that is so catchy, but it's got the word fucking in it. And you know, there's probably some people other than Rick that would be like, well, you know, can't you change that to, you know, mess it, messing my life up again? Like that famous thing of Jim Morrison. Can't you say, uh, you know, instead of, uh, what was that? Uh, uh, what is it? Uh, come on, come on, we can get higher or whatever on the uh, Ed Sullivan show. Oh, instead of saying higher, can we get, can't we get together? Babe? Or so, it was some ridiculous thing. And he, and he goes out there and just looks right into the camera. Higher! <laughs> just a big fuck you. Anyway, fucking my life up again. Great, great tune. The title track, Moon's, Mood Swings, is just beautiful. But then I, I just lose my mind on Soul It Screams and save me and hero these tunes are just beautiful i mean i could almost see people going like hey i don't you know marcus you know what don't don't break what's not uh you know don't fix what's not broken you know just uh you know maybe uh pan the pawn those tunes off on to uh beyonce or something you know maybe uh outside writer or something it's like nah man I like all kinds of music and uh, I love that about him. We've talked very, very deep and long uh, on the bus about just, just putting out music that, that you love. Cause you got to go out and play it. And it's that old, old saying, watch out what you get famous for. You know, you go out, you're some uh, blues, blues, uh, you know, like, oh my God, he's the new, the new uh, savior of blues. Nah. You know, it was like when I started comedy. You're a rock comic. You're a biker comic. Nah. I'll take the long, hard route. I want to be me. And sometimes I do ride a motorcycle. And I used to play music. And, uh, you know, I also like, uh, I like architecture. Maybe I'm in the architecture comic. Here comes the architect. <laughs> anyway, big love for you, Marcus. And uh, I'm super proud of you. And I've always loved you since the day I met you and since the day I heard your music. Authentic. I love your family. I love your dad. Great. And uh, I love your band. All the guys, shout out to Sleevis. They're on tour right now with uh, Chris Stapleton. They're doing fucking stadiums opening for uh, Chris Stapleton. It's just so great to see. I miss them all the time. And I never, ever will forget those two months on the road. Everybody in there, the, the, the good people and the ups and the downs of that tour. The incredible driver, Jason. Fantastic. And... Uh, Drew, Drew Smithers over there on the guitar. My man, Jack, killer groove on the drums. All those guys, I love them. And uh, I can't thank them enough for letting me have the opportunity to go out and tour with them and do that whole thing. I'll never forget it. Mood Swings, out now, Friday. On uh, is that American Records? Let me look real quick because I know Rick Rubin signed it. What this, this is why I hate streaming. It's Republic Records, a division of UMG. So there you go. And uh, you know, these streaming the only reason I hate streaming, uh, mostly is because the artists don't get paid. And I will ask you this if you are streaming. Maybe stay off Spotify and try to find who pays the most for the streaming. I'm not sure who it is these days. It switches around, but I'm a, I'm an Amazon guy. Also check out title. And I, I'm into that because I heard they pay a little better and the quality is fucking phenomenal. So many people send me over Spotify 
uh, links. Check out my band, dude. And they sent me a Spotify link. Uh, they don't even ask if I have Spotify. They obviously don't listen to the podcast. I spent years trashing them. I was going Eddie Vedder style, trashing Ticketmaster. <laughs> um, you know, I remember Marin going, you know, you got, you're not going to win that battle, dude. Just, uh, just fucking, you know, give in. And that's a sad thing because I think if the top 50 groups took their music off of Spotify and all the streamers for a month, you know, after two weeks, the streamers would be like, okay, let's renegotiate a, uh, a fair royalty for the lower bands. Because if you read deep into this, the bigger bands, they're making some pretty good money. They're still not making fair money, but it's the little bands. And uh, I, I truly believe if they did that, the fucking thing would turn around so goddamn fast, it would make your head spin. Uh, okay, that is my uh, fucking preaching there. Sorry to get into that, but it was just kind of, uh, you know, I think about it. Still thinking about those fuckers with their 41 beers. <laughs> this is something that happened uh, recently that I was uh, kind of, uh, I was happy about to hear, but also surprised. I, you guys know that um, I usually take down negative comments on my stuff. And people have said, leave the, com the negative ones up, let the people fight. And that's how you get higher in the algorithm. They love fighting. So uh, I usually take down the negative comments. And now I've just kind of uh, lost interest in it, you know, unless they're saying some kind of fucking dumb politics shit like you libertard. I'm not your platform for that. But if I do something and you don't dig it, like, ah, I don't like that joke. It, it sucks. You suck. Your hat sucks. Your glasses suck. Whatever. I'm just letting it fly. I don't give a fuck anymore. You know, if you are that bummed in your life and you get off on just shitting on someone, go at it, buddy. Go at it. But uh, somebody had left a comment. I was uh, wearing denim in one of the clips and I was walking into, I believe it was, um, let me see if I can find it real quick just to uh, see what I'm talking about here. They uh, made a comment, I believe, let me turn this down so it doesn't come on, about my ass. Something like, yeah, I want to fuck your ass or something. <laughs> let me see if it's on here. Comments. Let me find it. Let me find it, my friends. I, I probably can't find it. Um, let's see here, people. Come on, Dean, this is getting boring. Come on, man. Which, by the way, I've got a little project coming out. I think you guys are going to like that I'm doing with Troy Conrad's. Troy Conrad, the incredible photographer. And um, hopefully we'll have that done maybe next week. I will let you know. Let's see if I can find this. I don't know. I can't fucking find it. Um, but it was basically, oh, wait, it might be here. It's just kind of important because I, I want to make sure that I quote it right because I didn't really think much of it. Mm, let's see. Let's see here. <laughs> I, which, by the way, I've been putting up a lot of uh, clothing stuff just because I just love supporting these small um, companies, which, by the way, this weekend, if you're in Los Angeles, the inspirations clothing show is coming up and I'm going to go to that. I don't know how good it'll be. The old days, it was absolutely fucking fire, but it is in Pasadena and I will be out there with Kevin Christie looking around, seeing what we got out there. Um, all right. So anyway, I can't really find it. Maybe the person took it down. So anyway, they, they were saying, Hey, nice ass or something like that. Uh, you know, I can't even remember what they said, but um, I didn't really pay much attention. But this 
caught me kind of off guard. I, I wasn't ready. The guy emailed me and he said, Hey, sorry about that comment. Uh, I got a lot of people coming at me, man. And, and uh, holy shit, they were, uh, they were angry about that. And I was kind of, I was happy that some people had my back, even though I don't remember what the comment was or whatever, but I thought, you know what? I'll just leave these comments up and let the people go to town on it. I'm not going to engage with the trolls, but if other people did, hey, whatever, man. It was uh, it was wild to find out about that, um, that you guys out there had my back, and I, I fucking appreciate you for that. Um, really fucking cool. Absolutely. So I just want to give you a, a uh, shout out on that. And um, I guess that's about it right now. Oh, Shirley Jones from the Partridge family turned 90. And she is the original rock and roll mom. So 90, still alive. Partridge family was a big, big part of me. And, and when you watch it now, it's fucking wild. To think about here's this mom with the kids going around in a school bus painted wacky playing music very cool and i i've often said and i think i'm going to tweet this most people in the entertainment business want a peter grant uh you know style manager the zeppelin manager but in reality we all get a reuben kincaid <laughs> now most people aren't going to get that but to me, I thought that's a great fucking tweet right there. Uh, just in life. Everybody wants a Peter Grant in life, but we mostly get Reuben Kincaid's. Anyway, uh, Shirley Jones turns 90. Very fucking cool. And uh, oh, last thing I wanted to talk about. Two things. This GNR concert that got dropped on YouTube a couple days ago, something like 32, 34 years to the day of this show at the Whiskey. The entire concert's an hour and 24 minutes. Watch the entire thing. You're going to see it right there. Everything laid out, the blueprints of that group, the songwriting, everything was there. And it just took the right person to see the vision. I mean, it could have so easily not happened if they didn't get a record deal, you know? And we wouldn't have a GNR. But you get a guy like fucking Tom Zutat who signs him. You get a Mike Klink that understands how to bring in this fucking garagey band but slick it up just a little bit. And you have the masterpiece of Appetite for Destruction and the Illusion record. So... Uh, go watch this. Guns N' Roses, 1986, The Whiskey. It is wild to watch. And you too just dropped the entire... Uh, fuck, hold on, let me get this here. It is incredible what they dropped here. They, uh, I saw the tour. The... I think I love you. God, Partridge Family, cool. They fucking got some tunes, man. I mean, they didn't write them, but a uh, bunch of killer hits. Okay, here we go. Check out you 2 They dropped the entire fucking Zeropa tour in Mexico. That was pro shot. Oh, and tonight, if you're listening to this now, PBS has got the Elton John uh, tribute with Metallica and all these great people paying uh, tribute to uh, Bernie and Elton on PBS tonight. So fuck yeah, uh, Metallica plays funeral for a friend. I love you guys. Show's coming up. Going to be doing two headliners in San Diego and one night at Mic Drop. I'm going to be headlining Acme. I'm going back there after the mystery illness. I still don't know if it was food poisoning or fucking, I don't know. Uh, Acme, Min uh, Minneapolis, I'm coming back. And uh, in the next few months, a lot of great shows. I'm going to be at Berkeley at the uh, Greek Theater with Burr and the uh, Belco Arena two nights with Burr in Denver. I'll be headlining at, um, where else am I? I'm, uh, you know, let, let me just look on the fucking website. 
because I'm goddamn fucking old and uh, and dumb. I'm old and dumb. I'm not dumb. I keep seeing these things. Don't call yourself dumb because, you know, you're just fucking beating yourself up. It's negative. <laughs> Reverse inner inner fucking uh, negativity. Mic drop, San Diego, May 10th, two shows. Uh, the Belco Arena, two nights, June uh, 5th and 6th with the great Bill Burr. Greek Theater, Berkeley, June 8th. Blue Room Comedy, Springfield, Missouri. I'll be headlining June 21st and 22nd. I'm spending a week out at the Comedy Cellar at the Rio Hotel in Las Vegas starting July 8th. And then Acme, July 24th. There you go. Tour dates right there. Get them. Get the tickets. Help a friend out. Keep the candles lit, my friends. Tune in tomorrow for the uh, Watches and Wonders episode with Bo Gorey, Kevin Christie, myself, and a special guest, Amit Zappa. I love you guys. I mean it. Always have. See ya.